when Frank uh, Sissin first proposed this topic to me, um, I was a bit hesitant to accept it because I'm already, as um, Lukan indicated, not living in, in Germany for quite a while, for 25 years, and um, I've had in between a, a, a short period when I was in a small provincial Bavarian university, and um, I'm quite often in Berlin, but um, I live in Kiev now for, uh, for 13 years, um, and I'm not that familiar with the, with the Berlin discourse about Ukraine, about Russia, and, and Eastern Europe. And in a way, it would have been maybe more appropriate if somebody from Berlin who is sort of in, in these circles that discuss um, uh, German foreign policy more involved, uh, people like Stefan Meister, Gernot Eller, Susan Stewart, Ralf Fuchs, somebody like that who, uh, who is actually in place uh, there all the time, uh, but nevertheless, I eventually I accepted the talk because I think I'm, I'm still um, competent to talk about another aspect of, of this uh, whole issue, namely about the, um, the perception in Kiev especially or the Ukrainian perception of, of German um, foreign policy and how, um, how the German embassy presents the, um, or the German political foundations pre present uh, German foreign policy in Kiev and how the interaction goes on between the... Um, uh, the, the, the German and, and the Ukrainian actors in Kiev. Um, I will not speak here maybe to the extent that maybe Frank and other historians here would have liked to um, about the, um, the history and the, um, of uh, Ukrainian-German relations and also the, I wouldn't hesitate to call them moral deficiencies um, in the German approach to um, to Ukraine with regard to the uh, to World War II, especially history, um, um, that is some. And I'm not going to speak here about that because I think that was very well addressed by uh, Timothy Snyder in a, I would say, a seminal lecture in June last year in the Bundestag. He was invited by the Green faction of the Bundestag and gave an English language lecture. Um, there um, it was not in the main uh, assembly room, but in the, in, a, um, in one of the um, uh, rooms in, in the Bundestag. But it, it gathered quite a quite a large audience. It was taped. Uh, it's on video um, on on YouTube. And I would very much, if you have not seen it yet, encourage you to uh, to listen to it. It's a I, as I said, seminal lecture where he deals very well with this um, with this issue of how. Ukraine has been disregarded often in German views um, and German interpretations of, um, uh, of World War II. Instead, I want to add a little bit here to, to Snyder's um, outline, something that he didn't um, touch upon that much, um, uh, also, I guess, because it's not his primary um, um, re research focus, and that is namely the implications of um, uh, general features of German foreign policy for um, for the Ukraine crisis, for Germany's approach to Russia, for Ge for German reactions to um, the annexation of, of cr Crimea, and um, I think that um, of course this um, this lacking knowledge and the um, disregard for Ukraine did play some role, uh, especially until 2014 for German approaches to um, or for the inadequacy of German approaches to to Ukraine. But I think since 2014, um, the, um, the still, um, I would say, somewhat inadequate approach of, of Germany to Eastern Europe in general and to Russia and Ukraine in particular has actually more to do with uh, some general features, as I would see them, as of, of German foreign policy that have not that much to do with, um, uh, with Ukraine in spe uh, specifically. Um, so I think that um, that is going to be my main message here, and you will see um, uh, where, where this is going. So the larger factors that I will speak here about are, I would call, and that have influenced and are still influencing and will be influencing um, German foreign policy um, in general and, and towards Russia and Ukraine in particular are um, such things as I would call them a fundamentalist pacifism in uh, Germany's approach to geopolitics, a still lingering strategic provincialism in the interpretation 
and also in the actions on the international um, sphere, and also what I would call an obsessive verbalism or legalism in the, in, in the German approach to, to international affairs, a focus maybe more so than other countries on the words that are said or written on treaties, on pronouncements, on memoranda, and on protocols. And these are features that are um, sort of, and I will explain where they come from, um, that are very characteristic of German approaches to international affairs in general, and they are in a way a problem, or they are perceived as a problem nowadays in Berlin and in Ukraine what often happens that these general features, and that's why, I've, why I took up the, the topic of, of the, of the uh, talk here, is they are often not seen that much in Ukraine. I'm, I'm not sure how it's here in Canada, whether you are f uh, familiar with these sort of general features of uh, German foreign policy, but often there is a sort of a misinterpretation that certain, a certain behavior of, Ger of Germany is, is seen as something sort of um, anti-Ukrainian or inadequate to the, to the geopolitics of Eastern Europe because there is some, some general, some, some deeper German um, uh, disregard or, 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 or even disrespect towards Ukraine. And um, I think at least since 2014, um, this has, has changed. Um, uh, this, this factor is still present, and you, you see that in, in statements of some uh, even of some uh, intellectuals, uh, even histor German historians, who, who one would think would know better. But I think these are not the main drivers of what is today in, in Ukraine often perceived as an um, inadequate German approach to, um, to uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't deny that uh, uh, this um, a, a special relationship between Germany and Russia is a sort of problem in German foreign affairs. Uh, there is a certain affinity between, the, between these nations. There are certain parallels in the history um, that uh, makes them closer. There are connections. There are mutual influences, mutual manipulation, one could also say, and penetration. Um, and I'm going to outline these, these things here that, that create this special relationship between Germany and Russia. But still, at the end, I will come back to these general features of, of German foreign policy, which I think are more important for and explaining Germany's uh, current and, I suppose, future approach to, to Ukraine. First, one has to say that simply that um, the Germans and the Russians are the two, by population size, the two largest nations. Um, of Europe, they are also in terms of political sort of summary political power, maybe the two, the, the, the two most powerful. Uh, they are significant, uh, significant to each other. They are the, in a way, the significant others, others to each other in Europe. There are, as you know, as you probably know, dynastic ties, or there were dynastic ties between Germany and Russia. Most most famously. Uh, the, uh, the, Tsarist, the Russian Empress um, Katerina uh, II, the princess of Anhalt Serbs. There was a large influence of um, the German, uh, uh, a large German influence on the emergence of uh, Russian higher education and academic research, partly that is also uh, true of, of Ukraine. There is a lot of um, uh, mutual penetration of Russian and German culture that goes back uh, a long way. I just mentioned here maybe some elements, uh, German romanticisms and German philosophy's influence on Slavophilism, um, the influence of Dostoevsky on, uh, on German uh, conservative thought, for instance. Um, and that then also explains these these. Um, um, these relationship, uh, the uh, certain political um, uh, alliances, like for instance the molotov uh, uh, Ribbentrop uh, pact. Um, the war then also, in a very strange way, World War II, I mean, um, creates a, a certain affinity b um, between um, the Soviet Union and, um, and Germany in that um, uh, the Soviet Union first, but also then the Russian Federation. They became foci of uh, German cultural policies. Um, there, there is still uh, a remaining guilt complex that relates to uh, to the Soviet Union. It has largely, and that is something that um, uh, Timothy Snyder has addressed in this very well addressed, m much better than I could ever do in his lecture in the Bundestag in June last year. And that then comes up in, in statements um, um, by, by, by leading politicians, by older politicians who, 
who were either participants of World War II or, or were already um, uh, uh, teenagers at that time, like um, uh, Helmut Schmidt, Egon Bahr, Hans Dietrich Genscher, Erhard Epler, who have this sort of um, who feel a special special responsibility towards Russia and and towards German Russian Russian relations, and and uh, Snyder has dealt with the inadequacy of this sort of. Um, uh, approach. There was also then a certain parallelity in the uh, post-totalitarian past between um, uh, Russia and Germany. There was the, um, the uh, uh, occupation, um, if you call it that way, of East Germany by, uh, by Soviet forces. There is the, St the Stasi-KGB connection that um, now plays out, for instance, in um, uh, in in the uh, Russian dealings with with, with German economy, where, where uh, a prominent former Stasi um, agent uh, is playing a role, and that uh, found then also um, the special relationship as a peculiar ex expression of what it was called the Neue Ostpolitik, the new Eastern policy under um, um, uh, under the SPD Chancellor Brandt. Uh, um, the um, uh, New Eastern Policy, I won't go here too much into that. I'm assuming that perhaps uh, you will know about uh, this episode was a, um, an, a sort of uh, approach of, uh, that uh, West Germany took, took in the 1970s that uh, was uh, in recognition of uh, the permanence of, uh, of the Soviet occupation um, of East Germany uh, that tried to, to promote a new um, rapprochement between um, the West and um, the, um, the Soviet uh, bloc, which then also prepared the uh, Helsinki Agreement of 1975. Um, I mentioned that, um, although this is a very well-known episode here, nevertheless, because it, this um, uh, episode plays today also uh, a major role, I would say, in the uh, German approach, especially the Social Democrats' um, approach to um, Eastern Europe, because the, um, the assumption is here that the new Eastern policy of the 1970s was a factor that allegedly, and that is, I think, something that, in fact, is very much under question, secured peace in Europe, and that that was um, a factor that allegedly prepared then the downfall of um, the Soviet bloc and the, and the Soviet Union. At least this, uh, this uh, narrative is very present uh, today, and that's why um, this um, uh, sort of accommodationist approach is today uh, often then justified with the alleged success of the Ostpolitik of the 1970s. The, the problem here being, of course, that after the 1970s came the, or in the end of the 1970s, the invasion of Afghanistan and the enormous tension in the early 1980s before then finally um, uh, in 1985 uh, Gorbachev came to power. There's also a factor here of personal relationships uh, between Kohl and Gorbachev, between Helmut Kohl and, and Boris Yeltsin, and especially then between Gerhard Schröder and uh, Vladimir Putin, even involving some, uh, something like uh, Putin securing the adoption of two uh, Russian children by the Schröder family. Um, and, of course, this is still something that, that is, uh, um, uh, these, these personal relationships uh, do play, play a role, and, and Putin has been sort of um, um, uh, continuing this relationship with Schröder, using Gerhard Schröder's um, uh, influence after uh, Schröder left the chancellor's, uh, chancellor's office in 2005 for uh, exerting influence uh, um, through the ad um, appointment of Schröder first to um, uh, a Gazprom subsidiary, the uh, Nord Stream um, uh, Consortium, and then to, uh, to Ros Rosneft. Um, um, I think an often underestimated factor in the, um, in the closeness that emerged under Schr Schröder um, uh, between Germany and Russia was the joint opposition um, to the um, Iraq war in 2003, um, that was a moment in which, uh, indeed, there was a, a, in a major foreign policy decision um, uh, at least a parallelity. The, the opposition was perhaps uh, to the um, U.S. invasion or the U.S. allies' invasion of um, Iraq uh, for different reasons uh, from the German side and the Russian side. But at least there was a, this, this, um, uh, this joint stance on this particular episode that one can still what, uh, feel today, and it's still often to referred in, um, in today's uh, discourse. Um, 
what happened also was, of course, then after the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, an enormous um, influx of um, the so-called Russian Germans, uh, Russland, Deutsche, into um, uh, Germany. Often these were, uh, or sometimes these were not actually uh, ethnic Russians, but um, also, um, uh, uh, or ethnic Germans, but, but also uh, uh, simply Russians or, or uh, Russian Jews. But uh, they brought with them uh, in uh, to Germany uh, Russian culture. There were carriers, uh, I would say, also uh, a part of them at least, of a, a certain authoritarian culture that uh, uh, that I think is, is somewhat prevalent there and expresses itself today in a, um, in a stronger um, support of the so-called Russian Germans for the uh, alternative for, Germ for G uh, Germany uh, uh, right-wing populist party that is now in in parliament, and this sort of makes the the Russian Germans somewhat similar to the um, to the East Germans in their support, uh, disproportionately high support for the alternative for Germany. And there was also, I think, that um, a, a factor here that um, the um, the Russian Germans were perhaps more um, uh, they they brought with them also sort of a receptiveness to the um, to the Russian discourse and um, to the uh, Kremlin propaganda of the last years and the sort of Manichaean conspirological and anti-American um, uh, ideas that are spread via the um, uh, especially Russian television that um, that is um, freely uh, uh, available through cable TV in in, in Germany. Um, of course, one also has to uh, mention um, uh, Russian German trade. Um, uh, this is uh, not as important as, um, uh, as sometimes is assumed. In, in uh, 2012, I think the, the, uh, it was the highest turnover of um, uh, around 80 billion um, euros. Um, uh, last year, it was uh, 57 um, billion turnover, the, the summary export and import between Germany um, and Russia. But what is important here is that um, there are certain large firms that are to um, uh, that are organized in a in a special committee of the German um, Union of Industrialists, the so-called Ostausschuss um, der Deutschen Wirtschaft, the German the Eastern um, uh, Committee of the uh, German Committee, and that these uh, large companies that are organized in this um, in this organization are a rather effective pressure group. And although the overall German Russian trade is not that significant, it is, uh, for instance, less significant than German Polish trade. Um, uh, but uh, these, uh, this uh, lobby group is very well organized and consists of large companies that um, that uh, try to push their um, uh, their interests. By the way, I, I, I know some of the people who are involved in this. Some of the um, um, people who are involved in this l lobbying and who represent um, uh, German interests. And uh, without uh, saying here any names. Uh, one of them actually was a, a prolific Ukrainianist who, until until uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Rainer Lindner was the um, uh, the CEO of the German Committee um, of the Eastern Committee of the German I Industry, um, and um, as as far as I understand them, um, when they when they argue for for the reduction of sanctions. There's nothing personal about it, so they would they would be very critical of the annexation of Crimea, and they would clearly say say that this is illegal. But be, because they have uh, to represent the interests of the companies that are organized in this in this in this committee, they are simply uh, voicing the interests of these um, of these companies, and um, uh, nothing personal, just business, so to say. There's nothing uh, that is here, um, there's no deeper anti-Ukrainianism behind that. There's simply uh, the fact that these large companies are, for better or worse, I would say for worse, far more connected to uh, to Russia than to Ukraine, and therefore have then uh, these, these interests. That's, by the way, also a, a big misunderstanding, I would say, um, uh, on parts at least of the um, uh, Ukrainian public uh, sphere that uh, they, they, they have an understandably critical uh, um, uh, view of the German industry that pressures for the, uh, for the uh, abolition of sanctions, but um, 
there's not enough reflection about the simple fact that that, that has something to do that the that the German um, Russian economic ties are so much more in, intense, and that the way to go about it would be, of course, to to build up Ukrainian German economic ties, and then uh, respectively the the interests and the lobbying of these uh, groups would would um, uh, change. There's also one has to acknowledge uh, a lot uh, that Germany is a focus of uh, Russian soft or sharp power, as it has been also called um, in the West, and that uh, Germany is especially engaged in uh, in um, Russia is especially in, engaged in Germany with regard to um, um, activities in mass media, in in sports. Uh, that there are secret operations that are certain front organizations. Uh, in, uh, there are special institutions that promote uh, Russian interests that are supported uh, uh, financially by by Russia, and um, there are commentators that uh, have obvious t uh, ties uh, to Russia. The most prominent, perhaps, being Alexander Ra, and and, and there is now also a special institute in Germany uh, called Dialogue of Civilizations that um, has recently been created um, and uh, is. Uh, um, is probably uh, has the task to to promote Russian interests in in Germany, but uh, uh, has so far actually not not much of a, of a profile in in as far as I can see, at least from from Kiev um, in Berlin uh, uh, in the Berlin uh, discussion of uh, Eastern policies. Um, if you if you go through that, and I've mentioned here only some of the aspects of the special relationship of Germany and Russia. Um, you could even uh, conclude from that that um, the recent uh, German support for Ukraine and for the prolongation of sanctions is somewhat paradoxical uh, because you know if you if you only take this um, this part of the story then uh, you would perhaps even suspect more uh, German uh, support for um, for the reduction of sh of sanctions uh, um, but um, uh, the paradox here is of course that um, uh, at least verbally, uh, Germany has been very critical of Russia already for quite a while. For instance, um, um, uh, during the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Georgian-Russian conflict of 2008, um, the uh, foreign minister, uh, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, um, uh, said, uh, said then that this conflict, and that is a, a remarkable statement, had roots uh, that reached far back into the past and that, quote, we should base our assessments on the fact that the Georgian attack on Skhinvali was preceded by days of mutual provocations between Georgians and South Ossetians, end, end of quote. And I'm quoting that here because that is actually a statement from, from Steinmeier that uh, goes beyond the um, Tagliavini report, which, uh, <coughs> which I think had, had, had a problem with, with the issue of timing, that the, uh, this report by the, um, uh, by the um, or directed by the uh, Swiss diplomat fo focused very much on this five-day war and did not tackle, I think, enough the, the, the days and the weeks before, uh, bef before this war. And, and Steinmeier acknowledged here that, the, um, that these actions by Saakashvili that have been then often labeled as, as, as stupid or as... Um, uh, as uh, not thought through and uh, and as a big mistake had a prehistory and uh, already then Stein, Steinmeier was aware of that. Um, in a, shortly afterwards, in a, uh, Steinmeier also in an interview to the Daily um, Die Welt uh, on 17th of August said, quote, Georgia's ter territorial integrity remains the foundation of our, the EU's policy. In our talks with the Russian side, we have made very clear that by bombing and sending troops to the core of Georgian territory, they have crossed the red line, end of quote. Um, or when Russia recognized the independence uh, of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Angela Merkel condemned the decision as completely, uh, as quote, completely unacceptable and contrary to international law, end of quote. That is somewhat in, the, in contradiction. If you, if you, uh, uh, to, to what I told you before, this, this special German-Russian relationship. But then again, this uh, you could you could argue that here, uh, then shortly afterwards, this the special relationship comes again to the fore when in September 2008, um, a couple of weeks later, Steinmeier. Um, returned to, uh, fully to his pre-war discourse stressing the need of a partnership uh, with Russia in, quote, 
shaping the European security and peace order and tackling global challenges, end of quote. Or when he said, quote, I don't understand what leads some to make frivolous comparison with historical situations such as Munich 1938 or Sarajevo 1914. It is clear that our conflicts are no longer, longer guided by systemic differences and ideologies, end of quote. Or yet another one, quote, all those who consider inconsiderately, also by Steinmeier, inconsiderately talk of a new Cold War today seem to forget what the Berlin Wall and barbed wire, wire ideological rivalry and nuclear arms race meant concretely, end of quote. So here you have, again, then, the sort of the other side of the German um, uh, approach to, um, uh, uh, to Eastern Europe in this, or uh, to the former Soviet space, in, in this case, of Georgia. And I think that can be explained much more by the, this, this contradiction, much more by the peculiarities to which I will shortly return um, of general uh, German foreign policy than by any um, special German-Russian ties. Something similar to illustrate this point um, um, a bit more uh, happened in 2014. Um, speaking before the German parliament um, at the height of the, um, of the uh, uh, emerging crisis in March 2014, Angela Merkel stated that, quote, Russia's actions in Ukraine out and undoubtedly represent a violation of fundamental principles of international law, end of quote. Well, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, who was again then um, uh, already in the, in the second large um, grand coalition, again, um, foreign minister of, um, of Germany, said that Russia, quote, called into question one of the former, one of the fundam fundamental principles of Europe's peaceful order, the inviolability of borders. Such actions cast into question the fundamental conditions of, for peaceful co coexistence in Europe, end of quote. Or Merkel said at this time also, you, the Ukrainian conflict is, quote, about spheres of influence and territorial claims, such as those we know from the 19th and 20th, 20th century, but thought we had put behind us, end of quote. However, again, you then see after these statements during uh, the emerging crisis a sort of um, uh, return back to the, to the uh, sort of more conciliatory approach. This, for instance, in December 2014, um, uh, during an official visit to, to Russia, Steinmeier argued for, quote, closer dialogue between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union with the aim of making better use of our joint economic potential. He also stated that Quote, there can only be lasting security in Europe with Russia and not against Russia, end of quote. Or in October 2015, uh, Sigmar Gabriel, Minister of, of, um, uh, of the Economy, called for a, quote, new ways to renew cooperation, especially between Germany and Russia, and that there were, quote, various opportunities to further German-Russian economic relations in spite of the exist existing political issues. Gabriel also stressed that the Nord Stream 2 project should be implemented despite the objections of EU officials and some member states. Orched, Frank Walter Steinmeier, again in April, uh, April 2016, um, uh, about a so called double dialogue with Russia, quote, dialogue about common interests and areas of cooperation, but at the same time, an honest dialogue about differences, end of quote. So I think these um, ambivalences in the German approach to, um, to Russia um, have far more to do with, with, I would say, either you could see them as dilemmas or pathologies of German foreign policy than with any particular stance of Germany towards Ukraine or Georgia or Russia. Um, and they have to do with the... Um, uh, um, with these uh, three, um, um, three, uh, three elements that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. Um, so the, the first is, I think, the, one has to acknowledge that Germany has become, and for better or worse, and uh, nowadays it looks more for worse than, than for better, uh, a rather pacifist uh, large uh, European state that has... Um, regained, especially after the reunification of Germany, a lot of its international clout, uh, political power, economic influence, 
But um, in spite of um, this re-emergence of Germany as a significant player in world politics, has remained a pacifist uh, power that is mainly uh, acting uh, through soft uh, instruments, through developmental aid, and um, uh, diplomatic negotiations. That is, of course, um, a legacy of World War II and of uh, the rather different tradition that Germany had uh, before 1945. But it is also a policy that had f has found its, um, its confirmation later on in uh, successes or alleged successes that the German foreign policy uh, proceeding from this pacifist um, um, assumption has had. Uh, those, uh, as I mentioned already, the Ostpolitik, the Eastern, new Eastern policy of the 1970s is credited for preserving peace um, in Europe after, um, uh, during, Cold uh, during the Cold War um, and uh, also allegedly pr preparing the collapse of um, the Soviet system and uh, uh, Soviet bloc and Soviet Union. There was uh, indeed, uh, I would argue, a certain success of this um, of this uh, policy uh, during the uh, Iraq war where this pacifist approach then turned out to be perhaps a more adequate um, policy uh, with regard to Iraq than, uh, than the more sort of bellicist approach of other Western uh, powers. The second factor that uh, one should also not un underestimate and I think that is uh, very rarely understood in, in, um, uh, in Ukraine is the enormous strategic provincialism that we still have in Germany that is nowadays changing. There is a discussion in Berlin about German strategic provincialism, but it's still there and it has a lot to do with this pacifism again uh, with the uh, legacy of, of World War II and which simply means that um, uh, Germany has become used after World War II um, uh, to following in its uh, major geopolitical decisions the lead of other Western powers, in particular of the, um, of the US, and, and following into the, uh, into the line that is basically formulated either in, in Washington or in Brussels. Um, a second um, uh, aspect of this uh, tr strategic pro provincialism is also the, um, uh, the uh, enormous, uh, I would say, um, or significant, I would even say enormous emphasis in German foreign policy on Europeanization, <coughs> on conducting foreign policy not as a national power, but through the organs and through uh, the of the European Union and through the uh, uh, through a consensus of uh, at least the major member countries um, of the European uh, Union, and um, that is of course a problem in so far as the European Union is not a consolidated foreign actor. Um, the uh, European Union is in many regards a supranational actor, for instance, in foreign trade, but it is not a supranational actor in. Um, uh, in the conduct of its foreign and security policies and therefore has to rely on consensus or on partial, uh, on partial at least alliances, uh, which is also something that, uh, that creates, uh, creates uh, limitations for, for German activity uh, abroad. And that, that is also something that is, is goes very deeply into uh, the uh, sort of the foreign policy views of all the major uh, parties that um, German foreign, foreign policy has to be European foreign policy and it has to be coordinated um, especially with France but, but also with, the, with other members of the Euro European Union and which then leads to uh, uh, this sort of um, very moderate and, and, and hesitant uh, uh, foreign behavior. What is also, I think, uh, uh, often underestimated in Ukraine, I don't know how, how that is here in, in Canada, is the underdevelopment uh, of international relations and regional studies in, um, in Germany. During the Cold War, there was a, a significant um, um, East European studies uh, field in, in Germany related simply to the, to the threat that uh, the Soviet bloc posed for, for Germany. But still, this, uh, these East European studies that uh, had, had been established um, in West Germany uh, during the Cold War were not um, a sort of a discipline of a geopolitical power or of a, of a major actor of, uh, uh, in, in world politics, but rather um, it was simply the study of the Soviet bloc, especially of the Soviet Union, 
um, as, a, as a possible existential threat to, to West uh, Germany. Um, uh, and not something uh, driven by an uh, by uh, an aspiration to, to to play a major role in, in world politics. It was also partly economically, of course, driven, and by the uh, uh, interest, especially since the 1970s, uh, since the building of the large uh, gas pipelines um, between the Soviet Union and West Germany, um, by, by by these um, uh, interests. Um, an unfortunate um, result also of this um, politi political setup of German East European studies has been uh, the almost total absence of significant Ukrainian studies in, in Germany until, until recently. Uh, oddly, until recently, <coughs> at least, Germany had um, a far less developed uh, Ukrainian studies uh, uh, field than, for instance, Great Britain, which... Uh, which for obvious reasons has rather different uh, international interests that has many competing themes, so to say, with which to, dealt, uh, to deal with in the uh, international fears, but which still has a, I would say, relatively well-developed um, uh, Ukrainian uh, studies uh, uh, field uh, in political science, for instance. So we still don't have a, a Ukrainian institute in, in, in Germany. We have, for instance, four Poland institutes, uh, but uh, we don't have a, yet a Ukrainian institute. So there's currently um, 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 a Ukrainian chair being um, created for Ukrainian history at the um, uh, Viadrina University in Frankfurt-Oder on, on the uh, German-Polish uh, border. But this is going to be, as far as I know, the first significant uh, institutions of such a kind um, in Germany. There was before that a uh, um, uh, sort of half of German, of, uh, of Ukrainian philology chair in Greifswald um, um, and um, Ukrainian studies um, uh, summer school also in Greifswald, but that was basically it until, until uh, very uh, recently. The problem now uh, that, um, uh, that came up sort of with this strategic po provincialism was that um, already under, uh, under Obama and especially now under Trump, the, the, the U.S. leadership sort of disappears from, from Europe and that it's not any longer for, for Germany clear whom to follow in this sort of um, uh, uh, somewhat pro provincial uh, approach to, um, to uh, foreign strategy and that without, without uh, American leadership, so to say, the Germans were left on their own and, and basically in a, a situation to which they were not prepared. Um, at the same time, there was then also the, um, uh, I, th I would say, the more introverted policies uh, under Cameron and especially since Brexit, uh, the Britain has also somewhat uh, disappeared. Um, uh, in, a, in the international sphere in France is also, or has been at least until recently, been absorbed with its own um, uh, issues and, and not been providing any, any sort of uh, partnership or uh, not to mention leadership in, in international sphere which, which, um, uh, uh, which Germany could follow and, and, and within the um, formulation of, um, of European foreign policies there still remains um, also after the Lisbon Treaty, um, the, the deficiency of the um, uh, common foreign and defense policies of, of the European Union that, um, were, uh, that include uh, relatively pro-Russian uh, countries like, like Greece or, or, uh, or Italy um, into this uh, foreign policy process and thereby inhibit uh, uh, the formulation of more consistent policies um, in Eastern Europe. Uh, because of this pooling of, uh, of the uh, foreign policies of the uh, national states. And the third factor that I, um, I've called here somewhat um, jokingly obsessive verbalism or legalism or diplomatism is, the, um, uh, is an emphasis on, um, on, on, on treaties, and, but not only on treaties and on, on sort of official documents, but in general uh, about verbal communication in um, in the um, in the conduct of foreign affairs that that is simply uh, I think just the, the the flip side of the of the lacking uh, hard power um, partly the lacking hard power capacities of, of Germany um, but it, it's also partly a, a ref reflection of the um, uh, uh, of the inhi inhibit 
the, this, uh, the, the lacking hard power again is, is, a, is a result of the uh, moral restrictions that the Germans feel in, um, uh, with regard to the history and, and, and with reference to the history. But it's also, uh, I, th I would say, um, a reflection of, of larger issues in German mentality or um, old culture. So Germany sometimes is called a Richterstaat, the uh, um, is, uh, a state of the of the judges, so uh, 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 a kind of political system that is very much shaped by um, by decisions taken uh, by by courts, and uh, in general, an emphasis I would say not just in in foreign policies but also in other math matters uh, on rules and words on trust and and uh, uh, cooperation. Um, that has been then, um, I think this particular issue has then been also a factor that uh, sort of um, uh, was, um, uh, was something that at least in my, in my perception uh, brought about this uh, enormous disappointment that, uh, that uh, Germany had in 2014 um, with Russia that the um, uh, that both treaties that Russia had signed bilateral treaties multilateral treaties or memoranda or protocols that Russia has signed but also the oral communication between um, for instance Putin and 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 Merkel uh, was sort of um, uh, was in contradiction to Russian actions uh, in 2014 to the annexation of Crimea and the intervention in the Donbas and that was I think one of the major, major drivers then of the of the change in the German attitude um, towards um, uh, towards Russia and the uh, and and Ukraine so I think before that the the uh, the German pacifism and strategic provincialism and the search for cooperation was 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 I think a much better explanation for the sort of seemingly pro-German uh, policies towards Russia before 2014, and there was a, I think, a very inadequate uh, campaign in 2014 in um, in, in Ukraine, which uh, what's called the Miss, Mrs. Ribbentrop um, campaign, which uh, was a sort of um, a response to an alleged threat of a German-Russian understanding over Ukraine, uh, which I think there was never this the danger of that actually happening. There was a certain German uh, attempt to um, to come to some understanding um, with uh, uh, with Germany uh, with, with with Russia, but the um, but the I think the, the the misinterpretation here of the German approach was a was a double one. I think it was uh, first of all a misinterpretation that Germany would uh, would seek a, a separate peace or some sort of separate bargain with with Russia at Ukraine's expense. That was a um, um, a misinterpretation that uh, that was without without foundation. Germany would would not do anything like that because it's simply not that kind of international actor. But there was also a, a larger misunderstanding here that Germany would be would be uh, at all be willing and able to to conduct such a geopolitical uh, um, um, such uh, conduct such geopolitically. Uh, um, waiters and 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 consequential uh, negotiations uh, in in Europe, and and that Germany is a, is actually a world political actor that would like Nazi Germany uh, engage in such uh, uh, engage in such uh, treaties. So the um, the uh, the contradictions that I illustrated here with the. Um, uh, with these quotes from uh, Merkel and Steinmeier that are, at least in my understanding, somewhat in contradiction to each other, can, I think, be um, um, uh, interpreted by reference to these uh, features of German foreign policy and that um, Germany, at least for now, has not, does not have the, the approach and the capacity and the attitude to, fall, to, to actually... Um, Go through with with a particular political stance, as a, as a consistently um, uh, geopolitical actor. So it will always fall back to this, uh, at least for for now, to these uh, usual features of German foreign policies, in which uh, it would uh, try to seek for diplomatic um, solutions, because that is simply the the tradition of of German uh, foreign policy. Um, 
I want to illustrate maybe here the, um, uh, with one particular um, um, uh, issue that is uh, one particularly topi topical issue, what here the issue is, is I think, go going to be um, in German-Ukrainian uh, relations if we come to some sort of resolution with regard to the Donbass. Um, so if, uh, in, a, in a good case scenario, um, the uh, UN peacekeeping mission is employed to, um, to the Donbass or some other kind of solution is, find, is found to the Donbass, I think Germany, with, from its tradition of legalism, um, uh, will insist on the implementation of the um, political parts of the uh, Minsk agreement uh, agreements, which is a very touchy issue uh, in, in Ukraine. And um, so my advice here to, to, um, to the Ukrainian sort of leadership uh, would be if, if somebody would listen to me, and I've, I've tried to, to, to communicate that was very difficult in, in the Ukrainian, um, in the Ukrainian uh, context and uh, with Ukrainian politicians, is to, um, to somehow adapt Ukrainian policies uh, towards the Donbass and, and Ukrainian foreign policies to the particularly German approach to, um, to the uh, foreign policy and, and here to the Minsk agreements. What is the issue here? The issue is, uh, of course, that um, uh, uh, Leonid Kuchma, as a representative in the uh, negotiations of the Minsk agreements, has signed, uh, up, has signed uh, an agreement that would grant a special status and uh, would grant uh, special rights to the uh, currently occupied territories. And Poroshenko has also signed the attached declaration of, the, of, of Germany, Russia, um, uh, France, and Ukraine. And that thereby, um, at least in the German understanding, uh, the um, uh, Ukraine has, has entered um, uh, certain obligations. The Ukrainian understanding is here, uh, as far as I see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe somebody um, here feels uh, competent to, to correct me on this, is that this has been, uh, of course, a, uh, um, an agreement that has been made under pressure, uh, under gunpoint, so to say, and that this was simply an instrument to prevent further Russian advances, uh, advan advances military advances into um, uh, mainland uh, uh, Ukraine. And I would also see it uh, largely, largely this way. And the, uh, I think the misunderstanding that I often encounter here is that um, when, when Germans insist on the formal implementation of the Minsk agreements, then this is in Ukraine seen as a sort of uh, of recognition of Russian special rights uh, in in on Ukrainian state territory. Um, that is not necessarily the case, and the way out here would be, to my um, to my understanding, is that Ukraine should find a, a solution to the Minsk agreements that would, if you if you would use this um, Russian phrase uh, phrase, um, um, leave the. Um, uh, uh, to leave the uh, wolves um, um, satisfied, satisfied and, and, the, and the sheep uh, 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 whole. whole, whole, yes, thank you. Um, um, I think the, um, the a solution here that I could imagine here, at least from my perception of how Germans would approach this, would be that uh, Ukraine could, within its decentralization, create a parallel power structure in the currently occupied uh, territories that is not foreseen in the Minsk agreements, but is also not forbidden by the Minsk agreements. So one could imagine that um, at least for, the, for, for German, as I would see it, uh, diplomats and politicians, it would be fully acceptable that apart from the um, special status of, of the currently occupied um, territories and uh, from some uh, special regulations there, you would have um, you would have uh, uh, a parallel power structure with a prefect uh, or prefects in the Luhansk and, and Donbass oblasts that would have special national, national guards units and that would be the last political instance in the currently occupied territories. The, um, I think the, the Ukrainian misunderstanding is here that, um, uh, which is sort of more in the sort of, I would say, post-Soviet realm that of course, this would violate the Russian interpretation of what the future of the Donbas <coughs> would be. Uh, 
and the uh, or the Russian understanding, the panyatya of of this uh, of this kind of um, special status, and um, and somehow the Ukrainians also then take over the Russian understanding of what the special status of of uh, the currently occupied territories should be, namely that Russia should have some special influence there. But I think that could be neutralized by a formal. Uh, regulation that would be uh, acceptable to the Western powers would uh, certainly make Russia very unhappy, but would at least give, for instance, German politicians the uh, the opportunity to argue in the German political context to, for instance, the German parliament, to German industry, um, why it is supporting um, Ukraine in this standoff uh, with with uh, with Russia by with reference to a formal uh, formal. Uh, uh, implementation of the Minsk agreements on the on the Ukrainian side. I'm not sure I'm, I've, I've illustrated uh, this this um, this point very well, but it's um, it's just the um, so to say the the difference between the sort of post-Soviet panyatya and the and the um, and the German legalism. Yeah, that that the uh, that what I of, what I often see is that. Once the Germans start talking about uh, the political part of the Minsk agreements, the, the reaction from Ukraine is, oh, now the Russians are in, sort of. The, now the Germans are taking o over the Russian uh, discourse. But, but, but as far as I, un I can see, it, what, what Germany wants is simply a legalistic, a formal implementation of the Minsk agreements. What else there could happen is, is open, because everything that is not written down, everything that has not been signed, is, is open um, to discussion. In general, I think what the conclusion from all of that is that um, uh, uh, Ukraine cannot await um, that uh, um, Germany will, will take a, a very strong stance in, in the uh, uh, Russian-German, uh, in the, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict. Uh, um, the um, uh, German Support for Ukraine will always uh, remain within these realms of uh, strategic provincialism, pacifism, and and legalism. Um, still, what will and what does uh, uh, surprisingly enough, I would say, uh, continue is a strong German uh, support of reforms and of developmental uh, um, of uh, Ukrainian internal development, uh, decentralization, for instance. Um, that there will remain a verbal um, uh, support for Ukraine's uh, territorial integrity. There will also be uh, continued support for sanctions. There will be also, I think, at the end of the day, uh, Germany will support um, uh, an entry of, um, uh, of Ukraine to the European Union once, uh, and that is maybe now in contradiction to what, what apparently German representatives here have, have said before, once Ukraine has implemented the association agreement, I think once the association agreement has been implemented and Ukraine sort of has already entered the legal space of the European Union, I think then, then the legalism that is now maybe to the disadvantage of, of, of Ukraine um, in certain uh, German foreign policies will be to the advantage of Ukraine and that then Germany will be supporting uh, Ukrainian um, uh, accession to the European Union. In the same way, you could say that uh, Germany and other European countries have rather, uh, I would say, surprisingly supported the, um, um, the final uh, uh, implementation of the visa-free regime was once the visa liberal liberalization action plan was implemented. That was just to remind you, an action plan for visa liberalization that was um, adopted when the refugee crisis had not yet happened. And then Ukraine implemented um, this action plan. In the meantime, uh, Germany and other European countries have received a large amount of refugees. And the expectation of many Ukrainians was then that Ukraine would not actually get the, the, the visa liberalization because they have already all these refugees from from, uh, and they have already sort of uh, too many problems with immigrants. But here the legalism, so to say, was to the advantage, uh, as I would uh, see it, of, of Ukraine, and that the, the action plan was uh, uh, then um, brought to its logical conclusion um, in spite of the uh, changing um, politics inside and social situation inside uh, the, um, uh, the uh, European Union.
this is, by the way, and maybe I, I conclude with that, also one of the um, motivations, and that was apparently an issue, I don't know whether that was here an issue before I was in, uh, invited to the um, Canadian uh, Institute in uh, in Edmonton, why I have advocated um, that uh, Ukraine should be more sensitive in its foreign policies and its memory policies with regard to Poland. I think um, that this has very much to do with my view of, of Germany and of, um, of the European Union, that what I've observed um, is uh, in the last years is there has been, uh, with the... Um, uh, with Pavlo Klimkin becoming foreign minister and having excellent ties in Germany and uh, excellent um, uh, relations with the European Union. He was one of the negotiators of the association agreement. He was a very successful um, ambassador in, in Berlin. I think there has been uh, a little bit of an illusion um, about the degree of support that Ukraine could get from the European Union and in particular for, from Germany in the in the case of further escalation or maybe even a major escalation um, in uh, Russian-Ukrainian relations. I think the, that, is, um, um, that is an illusion one, one should not have. And uh, um, uh, when, when I wrote these articles about, um, the, uh, about Ukrainian-Polish relations and memory issues, that was still under, also under the impression of, um, of changing policies in, in Washington and uh, under Obama already, but also then under Trump, that has changed now uh, again a little bit. But my my fear was here um, when I wrote these articles that there would be too much of of, of hope on on German or West European support to to Ukraine, and uh, there's not enough emphasis in on in Ukrainian foreign policies on building alliances in Eastern Europe and not in Western Europe, and not so much um, with Germany. I would now admit that this has again changed a little bit. That uh, the um, the overall uh, geopolitical situation, as I see it at least, and maybe you, you'll, you'll correct me here, has has changed to the advantage of Ukraine. Namely, that uh, many many people in in Washington have now become so disappointed with uh, with Russia that uh, apparently, or as I see it, uh, Eastern Europe will be a focus of. Uh, um, of uh, U.S. foreign policies uh, to a larger degree than uh, that seemed to me uh, possible uh, um, uh, a year or a couple of years ago when, uh, when the main discourse was, as far as I perceived it, uh, that, that, uh, that the West needs uh, Russia in, in balancing China. So I think this, this discourse has now um, again become secondary. I think Russia is again perceived by Washington as a as a um, as a major threat, or uh, also as uh, as a as an inadequate uh, uh, partner, and therefore this I think will also translate uh, to uh, into uh, support for for stronger support for Ukraine, and overall now the the uh, the geopolitical situation I would say looks again somewhat better uh, for Ukraine, but. Um, um, uh, you still, I, I would say Ukraine has, has to be very careful in, in, its, in, in its foreign relations and in not misinterpreting the current German support for a continuation of a sanctions regime as um, a sort of German potential to be uh, a really consistent ally in a major new confrontation with Russia. I think this is simply not there. And as I've, I've tried to outline there, this has not so much or not only to do with German-Russian relations, but just with, with the limitations of um, German foreign policy and German attitudes towards uh, world politics. And uh, in my opinion, this will be a uh, constellation that will be there for the next years that will not change. I think there is now a change. There is, as I uh, indicated at the beginning, a discussion in Berlin how, how Germany should, um, uh, should redefine itself, its role in world politics um, under these new con conditions, especially um, uh, um, uh, during the, the Trump uh, presidency. Uh, but I don't see a major change in this uh, German approach. So it will it will be verbally always very supportive of uh, of Ukraine. It will uh, it will support uh, sanctions policies to the, to a certain degree, but uh, it cannot be counted on as a as a uh, as a full so to say 
a partner and friend of Ukraine in, a, in, a, uh, in the case of a, of a major new escalation with Russia. And maybe I'll, I'll finish on that. <laughs>